This is a story with a challenge for you to keep on learning. Hi, I'm Technical Sergeant Jim Cunning, United States Air Force. In three months from now, I'll be Technical Sergeant Jim Cunning, Bachelor of Science. I, like so many of you out there, have always wanted a college education. It was at Mitchell that I found in operation a college program that has since become the first and only fully accredited resident college in the history of the armed forces. I'm not going to tell you that it's easy to get a college degree. It takes hard work and plenty of sweat, but I will tell you that it pays off. Now, the reason I decided to enroll in Mitchell College and to stick it out until I earned my sheepskin is because this college program is a realistic one, one especially tailored to fit my pocketbook and the off-duty time available to me. This is how it's done. The first thing you've got to do is to make up your mind to go down and register. Then do it. A trained college advisor will help you select the courses you need to get the degree you want. You can get that college degree in less than four years if you do as I did. And that is, carry six credit hours each eight-week term during your evening off-duty time. These men have found one way of answering the challenge of higher education. There are many other ways available. Consult your information and education officer for details. Sands Proving Ground, New Mexico. Here, your screen magazine cameras found an unusual story behind the scenes at the famed missile range. It's the story of a group of men unique in the service, whose work specialty is so new that it doesn't even appear in service manuals. They are the missile recovery teams of the Range Service Division at White Sands. Once they've been briefed on a missile shoot, told the type of missile, launching site, an expected impact point, they move out to go about their unique military specialty, picking up the pieces. When all teams have reached their destinations, they go into action. After they have established contact with headquarters, the first shoot of the day is ready to begin. small percentage of the missile remains above ground, but every fragment must be collected. When the point of impact is reached by the recovery team, a marker is placed for the salvage crew which follows. A missile may bury itself on impact to a depth of many feet. This is where the heavy equipment comes in. At the collection point, known to the teams as the Boneyard, the missile remains are unloaded for delivery to the research laboratory. Here in the White Sands laboratories, skilled researchers will analyze the rocket fragments, gaining valuable information on the instruments and metals which best withstand the strains of rocket flight. The information thus gained will mean great improvements in the missiles of tomorrow. But these men spend little time reflecting on the work done today. There will be plenty on tomorrow's schedule to keep them busy. For the men of the recovery teams, 
the work is just beginning. Work vital to maintaining the strength of our arsenal of freedom. November 17th in the Almanac of Liberty, a stirring page in the story of man's struggle to be free. Halls of justice without which freedom could not long be maintained in our land. Here the individual has rights, even if he be an accused murderer. Well, there I was at the beach, and I saw the accused man run for... Objection! Objection sustained. You say you saw a man run out of the beach house? Yes, I was about 50 feet from the beach house. That's the house the body was found in. Do you see that man in this courtroom now? I do. Point him out. That's the man. Thank you. That's all. Just a minute. I wish to cross-examine. You say you had been sunbathing when you saw the defendant. Yes, that's right. Had you been in swimming when you claimed you saw the defendant run from the beach house? Objection! Your Honor, what possible bearing can this line of questioning have on the witness's identification of the defendant? I'm just trying to find out if this witness is telling the truth. Objection overruled. You may proceed. The right to cross-examine, a vital right. Here in open court, the accused has the opportunity to expose perjury, prejudice, or simple human error. But it was not always so. You may proceed. Sir Walter Raleigh, you are here charged with high treason that you willfully conspired with Lord Cobham to deprive the king of his country, stir up rebellion in the realm, and alter the religion. All lies. We have proof, Sir Walter. Have you forgotten Lord Cobham's letter in which he confessed everything and stated that you were his accomplice? You know that Cobham has repudiated that letter. You know that if you bring him to this court to face me, he must admit his charges were lies. It is sufficient that the proof offered is in Lord Cobham's handwriting. My lord, I demand that Cobham be brought before this court to answer questions under oath. Then you shall see who has been telling lies and who is speaking truth. You seem to forget that you are hardly in a position to demand anything. But my life is at stake. Surely I have the right to demand that my accuser be brought to face me. It's not convenient. Proceed. You have been found guilty of high treason as set forth in these proceedings. It is the judgment of this court that you shall be taken to a place of execution. This infamous there trial was long remembered. It burned its way so deeply into men's minds and hearts that the right to cross-examine became an integral part of English law and of our own. Then you were sunbathing after a swim when you saw the defendant. Yes, that's right. Do you usually wear your glasses when you go in swimming? No, I leave them at the beach house with my clothes. Then you weren't wearing your glasses. May I see them, please? See that sign up there? Would you read it, please? I can't. No smoking? That sign is no more than 20 feet away, Your Honor. I submit that the identification of my client by this witness is completely discredited. The right to face an accuser in open court was written into our own Bill of Rights, a heritage from a brave Englishman, Sir Walter Raleigh, another name listed in the Almanac of Liberty. silent weapon of the seas and the fulfillment of one of man's oldest dreams to travel underwater. The history of the development of the submarine is truly a story that rivals fiction. The first recorded attempt of man to descend under the water in a vessel of any type was in the period 356 to 323 BC. 
when Alexander the Great had himself lowered into the sea in a glass barrel. According to Aristotle, the philosopher, Alexander used similar vessels to repel a fleet attempting to lift the siege of Tyre. During the American Revolution, David Bushnell, a Yankee inventor, built this little one-man craft, completed in 1776 and called the Turtle. Operated by hand-turned propellers, it could stay submerged for about one half hour at a time. The Turtle was kept stable by lead weights, which could be detached from the bottom of the ship by the operator for rapid surfacing. Robert Fulton, the American famed as the inventor of the steamboat, also built a submarine in Europe called the Nautilus. He interested Napoleon in the submarine, but both French and British naval authorities regarded undersea warfare as impractical. The cigar-shaped Nautilus, about 24 feet in length, was propelled on the surface by sails, which were hinged downward and stowed on top of the ship when submerging. A submarine built by the Confederate forces during the American Civil War became the first undersea vessel to sink an enemy warship under combat conditions. Named the Hunley, this little vessel attacked the Union Corvette, the USS Housatonic, in the harbor at Charleston, South Carolina. The submarine was propelled by men turning hand cranks and was armed only with a gunpowder torpedo at the end of a long pole. When this crude bomb exploded, it blew a hole in the side of the Union vessel, which sank immediately. But it also sank the Hunley. The U.S. Navy's first submarine, named for her inventor, John Philip Holland, was officially accepted in 1900. The Holland had a top surface speed of eight knots and a submerged speed of five knots. After passing a grueling series of tests and expelling the skepticism about her efficiency and practicality, this submarine was finally given status by the Navy as a necessary part of our fleet. By 1914, undersea navigation had finally emerged from its long adolescence and was ready for the supreme test. Strangely enough, this war, which cast its shadow over Europe long before it came, did not break before the submarine was ready. The war could almost be said to have waited until the submarine spoke the word. Germany, more than any other major power, utilized the undersea craft to rescue her sea campaign from being wholly sterile and showed the world what could be done with an efficient submarine force. clearly demonstrated the necessity for undersea craft which were also trim and efficient surface fighters. Thus was born the USS Skipjack 1, our first submarine equipped with radio and diesel engines, and also the first U.S. sub to cross the Atlantic. The USS Flasher is a proud example of the World War II fleet-type submarine, the deadly raiders which did so much to break the backs of the Japanese naval and merchant fleets. Because of the high degree of skill and special training required for members of the submarine force, this group comprised the Navy's smallest fighting unit during the war. However, it was also one of the most efficient. In addition to its important supply and rescue activities, the submarine force accounted for more than half of all Japanese tonnage sunk or destroyed. produced the atom bomb, a technological breakthrough of the first magnitude. The Cold War, which followed, provided a stimulus for the development of ship reactors utilizing nuclear power. The Nautilus, the world's first atomic-powered means of transportation, 
and also the first true submarine ever built was completed in 1954. As the Nautilus sailed the oceans of the world during the following two years, her performance exceeded even the most optimistic hopes of everyone involved in her design and construction. Modern in every detail, and manned by a specially trained crew, she proved equally efficient above and below the surface. Her most astounding achievement, however, was the fact that she had been underway some 5,566 hours, traveling approximately 63,000 miles on a nuclear core no larger than an electric light bulb. One of the Navy's experimental submarines, the Albacore, as revolutionary in design as was the Nautilus, this sub is shaped like a streamlined whale. This Navy picket boat is traveling at twice the speed of the fastest World War II submarine. The Albacore speed, although powered by a conventional diesel plant, is highly classified. The Navy only says that it is in excess of 20 knots. As you watch the Albacore's periscope overtake the picket boat, you may get some idea of the speed of the atomic submarine of the future. When the skipjack incorporated the advanced design of the albacore with nuclear propulsion, man's dream of outperforming the fish neared reality. With submarines like this, man can disregard the problem of coming to the surface to breathe and look about. He will dive at the port and go deep into the sea. He will strike at the enemy and then return to surface again at the harbor from which he came. Another task of the submarine is the firing of guided or ballistic missiles. This submarine, the Barbero, is equipped to launch the Regulus-1, a guided missile with accurate control up to 500 miles. The possibility of launching long-range missiles while the submarine itself remains submerged, as this animated drawing indicates, enormously complicates the enemy's problem in detecting and destroying the attacker. On August 3, 1958, a new page was added to naval history as the USS Nautilus passed under the North Pole, opening up a new passage between the two major oceans of the world. Submarine, as old as history and as new as tomorrow. Not weather limited, but operating below the weather in a region where storms do not penetrate of greater importance in the modern world than ever before. Because now, with a nuclear power plant, independent of oxygen, the submarine has severed its last tenuous link with the atmosphere. It is no longer merely a submersible surface vessel, but rather the underwater counterpart of a spaceship. It is a deep ship, operating freely in its own element, and forming a vitally important part of our system of national defense. Fifty-eight short years from this to this. Quite an achievement.